You were talking a little bit about the beginning of how this project um, had started. Um, how does I don't how does it feel to be right across from Fashion Week uh, with this film? Fashion Week? Well, I mean, you were saying that it was created part of a um, a, a reel for the dressing room. Well, it's just I mean, one of the things that um, one of the things that I love about this about the whole process of this film is it happens so quickly with in a particular way around making something that was originally like I said when I introduced the film was supposed to be something for Costume National during Fashion Week that was just going to loop in their dressing room. We had a, we had a much shorter version that basically did that. And one of the things that, that for me that I realized that I actually loved and actually I feel like I do well at is having few options and having to come up with creative solutions around those few options. And the fact that we were that we were we were initially limited to that made it an exciting challenge for me to make a film that, you know, could be played here tonight. So it's awesome, you know, it's been a year. I mean, honestly, it feels like, in my mind, it feels like it's been, like, two weeks, and it feels like it's been ten years. Like, I sort of like, rah, 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 rah. But, um, it's great to be here. It's great to be here again. It's Fashion Week. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. It looks fantastic, doesn't it? Thank you. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it, it is exciting for me to, to, to have had a project that was really conceived as something so very small. And I think because it was conceived as something that was so small, it allowed us to take so many chances, you know? And I mean, I know for a lot of people, um, it's not their film, and for a lot of people it is. But for me, you know, and, 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 and you know, James will be here, and I won't speak for him, but I think for both of us, the fact that initially the, the stakes of the film and what we were doing was so small, um, it allowed us to really stick to our guns with what we wanted to do and take chances. And uh, Jay, how did you enter this project? Uh, I had been working with Travis on a documentary series that he does called In Their Room, and we had met uh, when he started In Their Room London, which has premiered at a couple of festivals uh, as a preview screen for In Sri Lanka And really, the first few months that we were working together, he was staying at my house in Venice, and we got a call from James, and he was like, what's going on? And um, yeah, it's been you know, a ride with him ever since, going on this, and now working on his next narrative feature, which we've been in development for the past six months, and you know, um, really enjoying seeing Travis uh, engage the narrative form and move from documentary into telling the stories that he really wants to tell. And how did, um, Christian, how did you become involved with this? Or did you guys work together before? No, no, we met through a friend. I was, I was working for kink.com uh, doing SNM porn. And, uh, <laughs> So. Side note, Monday night we're showing a documentary called Kink about Kink.com here. <laughs> and it's great, you guys, you guys. And James also produced that. So. It's actually pretty accurate the way the Kink.com film uh, described it. And James is joining us. Very serious crowd this evening. So um, we talked a little bit about how everybody was becoming involved with this project, and um, I know some of you guys in the audience, but my background is actually in film restoration, 
And Outfest has a collection of 30,000 items, gay films, outtakes, materials that we found, home movies and things like that in the collection. And I love this job because of all the little stories and these outtakes and this historical footage and learning the history of gay cinema is oftentimes told through what's left out, the subtext, what's censored in this case. Um, and I kind of sometimes felt a little bit like a private eye looking for things. So when I look at this film, I think of you two a little bit as searching for the story or searching for what was out and what was left out, and then you guys take it a step further and actually create what was left out. Um, so that's how I come to this film. So I'm wondering, um, James, how, wh why this piece of footage or why this story that you wanted to tell? Um, well, there were, yeah, there were many reasons. Uh, and um, uh, we discovered um, approaches as we uh, went forward. Um, originally, um, I was just, uh, you know, it was just an idea that was, you know, kind of popped in my head. I knew the controversies um, around the movie Cruising and um, that there had been protests uh, when it was being made. And um, and then I I had seen it on VHS and then, um, and then I guess when it, it took a long time for the DVD to come out. So it was really hard to get a hold of for a long time. And then I guess they replayed it at Cannes um, not too long ago when the DVD was released. And um, and then I guess that's when I found, I heard the story that there was all this missing footage. And, um, and then later I actually talked to Friedkin about it. <clears throat> and he, because um, at one point we were thinking about putting an interview with Friedkin on, in the movie. And then... Um, he was very open and talked to me and was very nice. And then when he, then he said, do not put any of that in the movie. So, um, um, I guess just because, you know, again, he, he was the director of the movie. I, I'm sure my, I don't know this, but my guess is he found himself in a very odd place where, you know, he was making a movie um, he probably, you know, didn't go into it with any bad intentions, um, but, and, you know, he's the guy that directed The Boys in the Band before this, um, and he, um, <clears throat> then found himself in the middle of this, you know, controversy and, you know, uh, protesting his film while he's making it. My, my guess is that he thought, well, you know, I'll be redeemed in the end, it'll come out and you'll see that it's, you know, it's, I'm, I'm just trying to you know, make a, a movie. I'm not trying to, you know, uh, imply anything about um, gay culture or anything like that, or uh, that it leads to murder or anything like that, but, um, um, <clears throat> um, and so I think he's still, you know, he, I think the fact that it had been shown at Cannes in 2005 or something, and, you know, that, that there was a little bit of a redemption and that it had been kind of um, seen in a new light, you, you know, decades later, uh, I think he didn't want, he didn't know what our movie was, so he didn't want to, um, you know, bring up any of the old bad stuff. Um, and which was not what we were trying to do either, not trying to vilify him at all. I think for me it was just about, um, here's something that, here's a subject that, and a piece that's vital um, for many reasons. Um, if we go, if we go and explore it, um, I don't know what we're going to find, but I think it'll be worthy because we can see, you know, um, what has changed uh, as far as thirty years later that you know, as far as what can, people are comfortable with in mainstream cinema or on screen or you know, um, and what isn't, um, what can be portrayed in you know certain ways and what isn't and really just an exploration and almost an experiment and um, then I found um, Travis and um, saw his work and, and immediately realized he'd be a great collaborator and so we um, just went into it together in, in a very kind of open-ended way um, so it was sort of just a journey and what you're seeing, a lot of what you're seeing on screen is just us 
you know, finding our way. Uh, and, and as far as the missing footage, you know, um, I guess it, it, when you were talking about it, it just it reminded me of something um, um, on the set of Milk, you know. When we shot, when I shot Milk, we went and shot in, on Castro Street, in the building where Harvey Milk had his um, camera shop with uh, my characters, uh, Scott Smith, and um, it's not a camera shop anymore, but it was the, we, sh we went to the actual place. And people, you know, in the community came out and were in the film and, and everything. And I, and I remember, I never had an experience like that as an actor on a film. It just felt like, oh, this is, seems so important. And, um, and we're at the actual place, and these are people that went, were there. And I remember thinking, gosh, how um, can Gus deal with all that pressure? Like, he must feel like he's got to get this right. And, um, and then there are these scenes, you know, between my character and Sean's character, Harvey Milk, in private. And it's like just these private scenes. So who knows what Scott... Smith and Harvey Milk talked about when they were alone together, you know, nope, they're both gone. So that's where, you know, that's where a create, that's where the creativity comes in. It's like, well, you kind of have an idea maybe of the things they talked about, but if you're going to make a movie, you're going to have to, you know, if you're going to show those scenes, you're going to have to take a leap. You don't, you know, unless you just do all the speeches, public speeches Harvey Milk gave word for word. You're going to have to take a creative leap and, and, and start figuring it out. So I, I feel like at some point, you know, with you know, Travis, we kind of just said, all right, we know our leaping off place and this is kind of the direction we're going to go in. And then let's just, you know, make it our own, you know, that it, that it, it, um, it will have more value than just whatever, recreating the actual form. Yeah, there's this idea with, um, you know, documentaries telling the truth. But I've always been interested in a narrative that, that gets to the heart of it and gets at the truth. And sometimes it can even become even more complex as the, the truth is because you can really access different emotions and actually get to where it's at. And that's what I like when I see this scene when we're, you know, it's actually the bar footage. We're there. It's some truth there. It might not have been the literal truth of what it was... Um, but you know what's interesting? You're talking about the truth behind those bar scenes. Um, in the original film, uh, the scenes that are in... I mean, when I think of cruising, and I've talked about this a lot by now, but in the original cruising, the thing that stands out to me is something that I don't think enough people actually give that film credit for are the bar scenes. Because those are real patrons, it's real venues, and Friedkin, I mean, Friedkin says this, the people who are extras in the film say this. He basically told them to do what they normally do in the bar, and that means drinking, drugs, dancing, sex. And the way in which he filmed that was very much like a fiction. And I think, um, you know, I think that's kind of an important capsule that gets lost with that film because of the controversy and, and the way in which and which gay men are represented in that film. And I think that's kind of an important thing, especially like right on the eve of AIDS in New York in that particular subculture. And, um, yeah. Um, I love the Val character so much. And um, I'm wondering, um, how was it working with him? Like this scene between you two, and he's like, why, James, this, is gonna, this could be dangerous to your career. What are you thinking here? You know, I'm with you 70%. <laughs> I like I like that it's seventy. It's 70. such a strange, arbitrary. It doesn't feel that way. Like your parents, I love you, but I'm with you seventy percent. I don't want to meet them. It's like this idea, of, like I'm, I'm kind of with you. But uh, back to Val, how how was it working with him or gaining this? Maybe with that, if you could talk to me about that scene in particular, like how much of it had you guys talked about before what you were going to say, and how much of it you were just letting the camera roll and you just kind of. See. 
No, I mean, most of that was improvised in our little script that, um, that Travis, it was basically an outline. Um, there was this scene where we would have a conversation. And I remember when, and, um, um, at first, when Travis first gave me that script, it all happened very, very quickly, you know. And um, I remember thinking, this is, you know, perfect, like we're kind of in sync because um, I, Val's an old friend of mine, he's somebody I've known for 15 years. And I knew, I guess, I just felt like, I knew he had an obsession with Al Pacino, but I also felt like, um, he looks so much, I mean, like, enough like him. Yeah, I mean, that's probably the part where the obsession came from. He just thinks he's like... <laughs> in love with his own image or something. But, uh, um, <clears throat> he, uh, I felt like in the movie Cruising, you know, they set up, it's the same, it, it was the same thing in, um, the Kazan movie with Gregory Peck, Gentleman's Agreement. It's like, this guy has to go undercover as a Jewish man to investigate anti-Semitism. Well, why didn't they just make the guy Jewish? I mean, why didn't, why didn't the Jewish guy? And so in, in Cruising, it's like, straight guy has to go undercover as a gay guy. So, but I felt like, in some ways, um, that Val's um, you know, own whatever upbringing or, you know, um, kind of uh, inhibitions um, would help him parallel the, the, the Pacino character in that film um, and that it would give us, you know, something to kind of work against. And, and when I saw that Travis had put that in the script, it was like, all right, he, you know, he automatically, he didn't, I was in Novell, but he already got it. And it was like, okay, that's really what our, you know, tension is going to hang on. And, um, what did Michael Warner say about, he said something about Val being, the fact that we had our central kind of person in the... I mean, what, what did he say after the fact? Yeah, when he watched it about, um, about Val. Oh, jeez. Anyway, that, um, <laughs> um, maybe that, but, but that was it. That was our end. That's the way that we, you know, we created um, a certain kind of um, conflict or whatever, something you know, to bounce off of, to put him in that situation. Well, and, and I want to say the whole the whole movie hinges on the the arc of of Val. Do you know what I mean? I mean, without without Val, I mean. James obviously is like a superstar in the film and a lot of people I think would come into the film thinking that the whole film was going to be about James in a certain way and maybe even James is going to play the character that Val played. But it's Val's arc that is the story of the film. And you know, there's, there's so many questions that people have about what is scripted and what is not scripted. And one thing I want to say to piggyback on what you guys were talking about is that first scene in the hotel like, that was literally the first time that I met James in person. It was the first time I met Val in person. And all of those reservations that you hear from Val in that first scene, those are real reservations that he has about this production. So, you know, it was this play back and forth with Val in terms of what he was really feeling and then what was scripted. And, um, you know, it created you know, quite a unique tension. Yeah, in a way, he stands in for um, a lot of the hearts and minds that I think you guys are trying to change with films like this and mechanics and some of the other ones that have been worked on. Yeah, and I guess the last thing to say about it is, too, you brought up, like, oh, he says, well, is this going to damage your career? <clears throat> to me, um, I think, if any, you know, maybe one of the unique things about the movie or where it can say, all right, Maybe it's trying something new. Is the is the is the way it does bring these different worlds together? Um, you know, a lot of these things have been said before, but that um, I was literally doing a Disney mainstream Disney film at the same time that we made this, and and, and that's brought into it, and then that this you know 
can go to a festival like this or a festival like Sundance, um, you know, shows that it's, you know, really trying to bring these different worlds together to see how they kind of work off of each other and when, you know, how does it look different if it's in one frame and then if it's in another frame, and it does. I mean, we do get very different responses depending on, you know, where it, where it's shown and um, different kinds of expectations or um, different kinds of um, audiences. So, um, but I think that's where it actually does get a lot of its, its strength. I want to thank these guys for coming out. Uh, we have another film that's starting at 11 o'clock. Um, if you have a ticket, you can stay in the theater. Otherwise, we ask that you move. Please thank, uh, join me in thanking these guys. Thank you for coming.